Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Sean Haney, founder of RealAgriculture.com, host of Real Ag Radio. And uh, I am here again for another episode of Real Ag Live. We are going to uh, get some of your questions answered. Our guest today is going to be Tom Wolf. The way that you get your questions answered is no matter if you're watching on Facebook, Twitter, uh, or YouTube, you can uh, write your question in the comment box and we'll get to as many of them as we possibly can. So as many as we possibly can. So I really appreciate you joining us here today. So let's bring in, if I can do that, bring in our guest, uh, Tom Wolf. Hey, Tom, how's it going? It's good, Sean. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving the shades. It's spring. The sun's out. You got to wear the shades, man. Yeah. Well, I've got this light going on in here to improve the visibility, so it's a little bright. Yeah. There you go. There you go. So, hey, how are you? How are you making out during uh, some of this social distancing stuff? Well, I realized that my work relies on interacting with people in in person, and uh, that all went away on March 12th. Basically, <laughs> that's when everything started getting canceled. So, it's affected me a great deal. I don't are you, like it. Are you, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of research colleagues out there, and there's a lot of concern about what trials people are going to be able to do. Yeah, we're concerned about it as well. Uh, we figure we need about, you know, a, a week to get ourselves up and running. Uh, we have everything we need, but we rely on others as well. So we have to abide by maybe their their protocols, which might be limiting, right? They might not be able to join us in the field and we need their help. So we'll have to see how that all plans out. It's too soon to say. Yeah. But I mean, I know that a lot of the plant breeders are in trouble because they can't, they, they would be sorting their seed right now prior to planting and that there's thousands of envelopes to go through. Yeah, and you know, I've talked to a lot of private companies and they've talked about how they're going to be able to get their plot seeded. You know, they've, they've changed some protocols, but I, I think there's a lot of concern all around, you know, depending if, if the spring is wide open, then, yeah, it's all going to get planted, and the research plots will happen. It's if weather doesn't cooperate, tight, tight window, that's where things could really go awry, because this is going to be a slow process. It is, and you know, when we used to be at the Icanta field house, and we would watch the canola breeders, for example, get their seed ready, there would be uh, five or six students in the same room around the same bench, just bagging thousands and thousands of individual cone seeder-sized lots of seed. This has to happen it's not happening, right? So uh, the window is small, though. Eh? I mean, if it's if they get this done on at the end of June, it's too late. Yeah. So um, we'll see. I, I I'm not super optimistic that uh, the breeders are going to get a lot done this year. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Let's let's talk about burnoff. Uh, we're we're at that time of the year. Weather is so so. You know, in, in parts of the prairies, we are seeing some above ten Celsius temperatures. A little bit cold still at night. You know, still below freezing. How does that impact our burn-off decisions on a daily basis? Well, all the you know these years when we have to go seeding as soon, sooner rather than later because uh, the season is actually in fact getting on and the, the weeds might not be up. So careful scouting is essential. Uh, a lot of guys didn't do a burn-off last year because uh, for that same reason and had to had to make some of those calls. On the other hand, though, uh, when you do go with you into your burn-off situation, we are really saying uh, use uh, tank mixes. You know, use multiple effective modes of action in your burn-off. Uh, we want to make sure we delay the onset of certain kinds of resistance to glyphosate products. And we have to have two additional modes of action in that tank to make sure that the kochia that is already resistant to several of those uh, does, in fact, get caught. And also to, to delay the onset of other other possible glyphosate resistance cases and those those new products or those alternate products are not like glyphosate at all they're group 14s group 15s group 6s they're contacts and so they need a different kind of application method for example different water volume different droplet size yeah and what are some of the best management practices for that to ensure success then yeah, so traditionally glyphosate has always worked a little better with larger drops and smaller water volumes, and now these other products are exactly the opposite. We have to meet in the middle. So we we will have to go from the 5-gallon per acre glyphosate to maybe a 7 or 8-gallon per acre with a group 14 or 15 tank mix. Now, some of the glyphosate activity might be reduced, if especially if the water is hard or if the glyphosate rate is low, and we might have to go to a higher rate of glyphosate for that reason, or we might want to deal with the water quality issue by adding a conditioner like ammonium sulfate. And is generic glyphosate okay or do you need to be concerned about that at all? 
Well, uh, the generic glyphosates are the old 360 formulations, and they're proven. Uh, they don't have the weather, the rain fastness. They don't have the, the you know the active ingredient load, so you need more product. So there's a few downsides, but they're as suitable for this tank mixing as the other glyphosates. You just have to make sure that the uh, the rates are are appropriate. That's all. Okay. Um, interesting. It's because just going with a flat, straight glyphosate at this point, we're we're really probably not setting ourselves up for the success we want. We we need to have those tank mixes. Yeah, I think our, the wheat science community has been preaching or singing from this from the same book, the same hymnal for quite a while, which is uh, do not spray just glyphosate anymore. Uh, spray glyphosate with a tank mix partner. Uh, you know, every time we spray we apply selection pressure for glyphosate resistance. Uh, we heard now in Australia this winter that wild oats are resistant to glyphosate in Australia. Uh, you know, this is very disconcerting because we, you know, that's a very important weed for us. So we have to make sure that that doesn't happen uh, quickly here. And the best way to avoid it is to apply these tank mixes that get wild oats without relying on glyphosate. Yeah, I really, I, I think across the country now, we've we've had enough occurrences of weed resistance and glyphosate that it, it's not like a, it's not an if, it's more like a when. And so I'm, I'm seeing a lot more growers, I don't know about you, but I'm seeing a lot more growers being way more proactive on this one. Yeah, I'm glad to hear it. You know, the danger of, of these things are that they're actually quite slow moving. You know, we've talked about resistance for 20, 30 years now, and and still, it's still creeping. It's a small movement, and we tend to get used to uh, the status quo, even though the status quo is always changing. We think, well, that's normal. It's normal to have some resistance. Uh, and it's But at some point, uh, the resistance becomes unmanageable. And then it's a little bit too late to prevent it, right? Then all you can really do is try to get around it with other uh, herbicide mixes and so on and so forth. But you can't put the worms back in the can. It's uh, it's too, it's it's out. Hey Tom, got a question here from uh, Khalid. He says, "Is it okay to spray glyphosate if night temperatures are below five Celsius?" What do you think? So there's quite a bit of. Uh, uh, information about that, uh, the I think all of our herbicides rely on, on actively growing weeds. And uh, and so a, a five degree Celsius overnight low is not a problem. Uh, it, you know, it, it'll warm up to 15, 20 degrees during the daytime. The weeds will be actively growing and they weren't actually inhibited by that uh, that low temperature. The problem is if it's minus five overnight, which oh. can also happen in pre-seed burnoff. <laughs> now those plants have been hurt. Uh, they'll probably recover uh, but they won't be in any, any position to up you know to take up and translocate glyphosate anytime soon or any herbicide so the advice has always been to wait a few days to monitor the the growth and health of those weeds make sure they're growing again and then uh, it's safe to open that window up again okay uh shout out to ken Kura who's uh, tuning in margaret may says hello to the both of us hey thanks a lot guys for uh for tuning in here. We got a question, Tom, from Brent. I'm going to switch the question on the screen here. Just bear with me. A uh, question from Brandon Gibb, who asks Group 1 and glyphosate resistant wild oats. What a nightmare. What do you do with that? Hey Brandon, how's Texas, buddy? Yeah, he's a uh, Texas transplant. <laughs> he he he's avoiding all this Canadian weather now, moving to Texas. The shots are amazing down there, aren't they? Like they got full blown spring. What a concept! I know. Um, yeah, Brandon, it's a nightmare. Uh, I think we really have to look at what our options are anymore uh, to getting wild oats in a burn off or in crop, and there aren't that many. And Charles Geddes at the uh, at, uh, AFC in Lethbridge has uh, compiled a list of, of options. Uh, very few of them are post-emerge, actually. You know, there's in, in canola, it's Liberty. Uh, I don't have them off the top of my head, but there aren't that many. Group two is obviously in cereals. But beyond that, we might have to go into soil actives. And we have not gone into soil actives nearly as 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 bigly as uh, as the US have. So we have fewer options right now that are that are common. But yeah, it's uh we relied, you know, in many ways glyphosate delayed or or slowed the creeping 
incidence of group one resistance in wild oats because we were able to rotate out of group ones for our oil seeds with glyphosate tolerant crops right mm. so we we took away some selection pressure and if we don't have that tool anymore uh yeah it could be very serious yeah well he says it's warm and 85 there so <laughs> what's 85 I have warmer no than here that. that's that's what all you need to know that's all you need to know uh <laughs> there's another question here from uh, Botnari, who says, Hey, Tom, what's the best tank mixture with glyphosate for better results? Glyphosate plus 2,4-D? Oh, well, it depends on better results with for what. You know, better results with glyphosate or better, better uh, overall success with other weeds and herbicide uh, resistance delay. Uh, I would I would refer you to the companies that specialize in these tank mixes, uh, FMC and New Farm. New Farm has a large portfolio of group 6, group 14, group 15 uh, possibilities that give you all the choices. And you just simply have to go for weed spectrum. What is your weed spectrum? Uh, what do you need to get it? Okay. Uh, question here from John says... Uh what about micro tie-up with glyphosate use? That's out of my wheelhouse. Really is micro tie-up. What a, because glyphosate's you know been known to be a quote chelating agent and it ties up micronutrients. I don't uh, know. I'm I don't think I'm going to be able to comment, but uh, maybe someone else can. But I, I I'm not that person, unfortunately. Okay, uh, a lot of talk about these products like Interlock uh, L1700. What about them? Yeah, Interlock and LI700 are adjuvants that have recently become more popular because of their ability to do a couple of important things. One of them is, of course, drift reduction. They actually reduce the proportion of driftable fines in most sprays. The effectiveness depends on what nozzle you're using and what your, your tank mix is, but they're oily products. And so they don't increase droplet size per se, like a low drift nozzle does, but instead they cut away the driftable portion. And they're actually quite effective. They're not quite as powerful as our traditional hardware methods. So, you know, nozzle choice is still the biggest hammer. Boom height spray pressure are huge hammers. Uh, travel speed even is, a, is one that probably will do more for drift reduction in those adjuvants. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes when you've done everything you can, you still see a cloud behind the sprayer and you might be spraying Liberty. That's a, a classic example where the fines are really hard to minimize. Interlock or LI700 will further reduce those fines beyond what the nozzle has already done. So, so that's actually a very positive. Are they, so they fits in all situations or not? Not really. Uh, so, you know, LI700 does a couple of other things. It's also a, a pH adjuster. So it, it acidifies the spray mixture, and that's not always good. It's sometimes good, but it's not always good. Some herbicides don't like to be acidified, and they don't dissolve as well as a result. And that could mean, uh, if not loss of efficacy, then certainly a harder time cleaning the tank out because some of it's precipitated clogging of filters, those kinds of issues. I'm not a huge fan of acidification, to be quite honest. So I'd prefer to leave that out of the picture um, okay. to avoid problems. Yep. Uh, okay, well, well Brandon, he, he, he had a Canadian question, but now he's got a Texas question. He says, uh, when relative humidity is reaching 5 to 10% and it's hot, should we, what should we do to increase water volume? That's a great question. And I didn't know it was that dry down there, but, you know, that does – that does raise this this concept of what's called delta T. And delta T is really the temperature, uh, the difference in temperature between a wet bulb and a dry bulb, which we use essentially to measure relative humidity. The greater that spread, uh, the faster droplets evaporate. And the, it, it could even mean that they evaporate to dryness before they actually hit the ground. So you in, in a two or three seconds that it might take for a spray droplet to, to go down to the ground, they're gone. So that's a serious problem for efficacy. What can we do? Well, actually, a more water volume, you know, moving from 5 to 10 gallons or from 10 to, to 12 helps because it also lets you use larger drops. And larger drops have a longer lifetime. And that has been one of the reasons that large – sprays or coarser sprays are actually successful in, in, in our drier climates. They, they do that and it's a part of the picture. Question from uh, big real egg fan, Danny Ottenbright. He wants to know what is the best foxtail control in oats? Oh, oh. <laughs> Stampede. No, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> 
I don't know either. So I've Garrett Johnson. I, I don't know. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's just it's just a, I'm not a, you know unlike some people I I really don't um, know too much about which herbicide for what weed and what situation. Um, but you'll tell how them how to, to apply, apply herbicide. It. You'll tell them how to apply it. Does Tom have, this is from Lindsay, does Tom have a favorite multi-purpose nozzle? Mm-hmm. And I, it, I it, do, it, and then by, I'll never tell you. But if, if <laughs> by like, she means, do you sleep with it under your pillow? <laughs> it's funny, you know, um, if I find a pair of pants on the chair and I, if I put them on, probably there's going to be a a nozzle or some such thing in, in its pocket somewhere. I, I usually find them in my jacket pockets. They're, they're all over. They surround me. They're in the, uh, they're the cubbies of my, of my car. The, uh, my coffee cup rests on nozzles. Um, I have nozzles on my, on my desk, uh, right here beside me. Uh, you can't see this cause yeah, here you can. I can see it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I, but no, I don't have my favorite nozzles and I do not give them names. You don't ever. I call them by their given name. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it's a good title of the question. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Continuous rinsing. I know this is something that is, uh, you know, a question you get lots. Um, talk about that. So, you know, this is such a great technology that we, we we kind of stumbled on it was we were first made aware of it through some contact with a german company named agrotop they actually make the green leaf nozzle and they made us aware jason and i my partner in spurs 101 uh jason devoe uh of a way to rinse your tank while still spraying and all it requires is uh an empty tank and a second pump just to run the um uh uh, the clean water supply. So what that really means is it means you clean faster, you dilute the tank more effectively, uh, you don't you you save time, and time is really the agronomic currency that creates good outcomes, isn't it? Timeliness is agronomy, and uh, if we can save time during mundane tasks related to spraying that aren't actually spraying we gain spray time which means we're more likely to do things on time that's the whole point so we're huge proponents of uh, continuous rinsing basically it means yes like i said second pump dedicated to your clean water tank you spray your tank empty of product and be without turning off the uh, solution pump you turn on the second pump which starts to rinse the tank down using the wash down nozzles at the same time, the solution pump gathers that rinse aid in the sump and sprays it back out to the boom. It allows for very rapid dilution of the spray mix and eventually then creates a, a, a relatively clean plumbing system in maybe five minutes, however long it takes you to empty the 120, 150 gallon clean water tank on your on your sprayer. So that's been powerful. Then when you get to your driveway after doing that headline pass, maybe cleaning out, you can pay attention to your screens. Uh, your boom ends, other things that need uh, need cleaning. Tom, you've always been a big proponent of, you know, instead of driving faster, why not focus on that reload time? You know, where the sprayer comes to the edge of the field, you're up to that sprayer truck, reloading that sprayer as quickly and efficiently as possible, almost treating it like a NASCAR team. Now, yeah. this spring, that could pose a problem because we're trying to practice some COVID-19 uh, protocols have you been getting questions from growers about how to properly do this in this environment? Not so much. I mean, you know, to be honest, most of these operations, spraying operations with the tender trucks are still one person jobs. So you'll see the same person uh, maybe drive the tender truck. Often it'll trail the sprayer as well. And they will do all this themselves. And only in rare instances do we have a second person present who maybe does a hot batch premix and they will prepare the next tank charge while the person is emptying the current tank. And then when they come up, you just have to hook up, transfer over, maybe top up and you're done. Takes four minutes. Uh, that's a powerful way. And we are seeing hot tank, you know, hot batch tanks become available. Uh, and that's, a, I think, an important productivity tool, but doesn't really require working closely together if, in most cases. Yeah. Okay. 
so let's talk a bit about some of that uh, things you can do at that reload time to increase that downtime so you're getting more acres done in the day, especially if there's a tight window. The first thing you're going to do is just do business as usual and find out how you're spending your time. That's the first thing. That's time accountancy. Uh, so basically what I want to do is find out, okay, how much time are you spending driving your sprayer that needs reloading to the tender truck? <laughs> that might be two or three minutes. I don't know. Uh, how much time do you spend dragging a heavy three-inch hose and hooking it up? How much time do you do? Do you spend doing the calculations for transferring that partial tank that you might have uh, that is not routine? Do you trust the? Do you trust everything? Are you full throttled or are you cautious? Do you know how much is going into your tank and how much do you, how much do you check it and second guess whether it's how full it is? You know, these are the little tiny things. That, that really matter and they add up. Everything takes one minute, which you can dismiss, but taken together, it might be 10 minutes. So time accounts is number one. Mm -hmm. Then you look and say, okay, where can I cut and how do I do that? And it might mean going from a, you know, a certain kind of inductor to another kind. You might get rid of the product pump because you're waiting on Liberty to pump over. It might take 15, 20 minutes. Your water's full. You're just waiting for the product to come. And uh, so then you might move to an inductor. Those are the kinds of uh, questions that we need to answer first. But the biggest, the biggest uh, improvements have always been uh, going to uh, you know a Venturi inductor uh, that can draw even Liberty, uh, even cold Liberty across, uh, maybe 150 liters across in in three or four minutes, and uh, and that's a big, big part of the productivity game. Uh, question from. Uh I think it's Niels or Niles. He says, uh, just ordered a new sprayer and need to select nozzles for the triple bodies. What should I consider? Well, uh, usually we'll, we'll talk about water volumes. You know, we'll talk about 5, 10, and 15 gallons for your burn-off, your in-crop, and your maybe later season sprays. And those can all be the same brand of nozzles. So if you uh, are comfortable with a certain drop size, such as is produced by the average air induction tip, and we're talking about maybe in alphabetical order, the air bubble jet, uh, the green leaf air mix, uh, the hypro pent air, guardian air, uh, maybe the uh, the Leckler IDK or the T-Jet AIXR. So those are four or five that I've just listed that are essentially the same droplet size. They're low drift, decent coverage. You can get those in 5, 10, and 15 gallon sizes and get one of each. And that is your basic setup that I would always recommend. And then there's a few special cases. You know, the, now let's say, okay, you're doing your fungicide, you're in fusarium head blade country. You might not be satisfied with just a single ordinary nozzle. You might want a twin nozzle to better target the heads. Well, then we'll go to a fourth nozzle for that. Uh, or maybe we'll just use your 15 gallon tip and make that a twin and then use a twin for all your high volume applications. That's also okay. So those would be your three basic ones. I like how you, in, in alphabetical order, you do like a disclaimer. You, you, you've you been doing this long enough that you know you need to do that. That's why I don't have a favorite nozzle, Sean. <laughs> Tom Wolf I, love, said, I love them all. <laughs> Tom Wolf said, I, they're, they're all my children. They're all my children. <laughs> all beautiful and different in their own ways. <laughs> what, yeah, about, okay. what about recirculating booms? <laughs> I love this concept of recirculating booms. You know, we talk about a skeleton in the closet of the egg industry. And that is, what do we do with our, you know, little little pesticide spills? What would, do we have them? Uh, do they happen at all? They happen all the time. They're unavoidable. And I blame sprayer manufacturers. I'm passing the buck. But I think that sprayers are designed in a way that makes it difficult to avoid putting product on the ground. Let me give you just a couple of examples. Let's say that you're driving out into the field and you have to prime your boom. It's, it's got water in it from the last clean out and it now has to have uniform product all over. What do you do? You spray until the last nozzle has product to avoid the V starting shape. That takes 30, 40, 50 gallons of product to do that. And it's on the ground is where that goes. A lot of it. How much money is that? Your your tank mix might be 10 or 15 bucks an acre. You've just put five acres worth on the ground. So that's a, a couple hundred dollars possibly. With a recirculating boom, you don't have to do that. You can prime your boom and rather than spray out 
all that product, it goes back to the tank because the boom end isn't a dead end. It's a return line to the tank. Mm. And so now you can, you don't have to turn your nozzles on at all. You just run product through the boom until it's fully primed and then you start spraying. You haven't sprayed a drop. Likewise, at the end of the day, let's say you're not done your tank, but you're going to resume tomorrow with that tank and you don't want to leave that product in the boom. You can take your recirculating pump dedicated to your clean water tank and if you've plumbed that correctly, push that water through the boom and push the plug of product that's in the boom back to the tank. Have you sprayed anything out? No, but the, the boom is now full of water. Very handy. Okay, so this means no more spraying stuff on the ground in that special spot. Everybody has that special spot in the field. That special spot. So, okay, <laughs> so what, why is that not standard on sprayers? Um, you know, it is very common in European sprayers. Uh, and I, I, I would say probably because they have a more competitive marketplace. I think that's probably the main reason. Um, I don't know any other reason uh, why that might be. It's tradition. A lot of it is just, hey, we've always done it this way. People are used to it. Uh, but it has these downsides. Uh, a recirculating boom does cost more because you now need individual nozzle shutoff. So sectional control is no longer done with a master valve controlling each of the anywhere from five to 13 sections. Now you have sectional, you have nozzle shutoff with a solenoid controlled nozzle valve. That might cost 30 to 150 bucks. It depends on what you get. And that's an additional cost. Mm. And you also have to make sure that your rate controller works with that, right? So there's a little bit of a, but you know, at, at the factory level, that can be solved. Okay, so I, I was just uh, being the producer and uh, putting stuff, I was doing producer duties, not host duties. D did you address the retrofit, how you can get retrofits for that? <sighs> Uh, it's amazing how you tune out when you when you have well, to. I was I was figuring else. what comments to post on the, on the super, and then <laughs> I'm, I'm totally cool with it. <laughs> yeah, you can you can retrofit. So some of my guys, what they're doing is they are doing it themselves. So they, what they're doing is they're taking their boom sections, and they're actually taking the end caps off, and they're just putting a rubber hose to connect to the adjacent section. So they're stringing them together, and you could use a, a, a length of pipe if the boom isn't folding there, but if the boom folds, rubber hose, bingo. The the outside, very outside end of the of the boom, the outside end cap, that's where you feed your that's where you feed your pressure. Okay, from the pump to the very outside and then it goes through the boom towards the middle and comes together. Oh, I should do this. Comes together and uh, and goes back to the tank. And then you have individual nozzle shutoffs in between. That's really it. All you need is a valve that controls the flow back to the tank. Do you want it to come back to the tank or not? Mm. It's on or off. That's it. So it is retrofitable. But there's a new thing. Um, so just a month or two ago, a fellow by the name of Kurt Kamen uh, developed something called the SRV2 valve. And it allows you to convert your individual section in your boom to... Uh, a recirculating section. So that means that you take your end caps off and you bring them back to the feed line that fed that actual boom section. And where they meet, that's where you would install a new valve. That valve has a venturi built in that actually takes that flow from the boom ends and, re and funnels it back into the feed to that same boom. So the flow never ends at the end cap. So you don't get the sedimentation, the caking problems. And if you want to rinse it, you just push water through and eventually that whole boom's going to be water. We're almost out of time here. So if you do have a question, make sure you put it into the comment box. Uh, Tom, PWM nozzles. Uh, I know this is a huge passion of yours. Yeah, PWM is a huge thing. I mean, it's, it's improved the way we do, uh, we, the way we spray, but we still have a shortage of nozzles. We still are having a hard time, for example, filling the need for uh, things like um, uh, twin nozzles and so on and so forth. And excuse me for a second. <laughs> Bless um, you. And uh, I should have gone on mute for that. Um, <laughs> and those, uh, those sections... Um, uh, those special nozzles just don't exist. So we we need to encourage the nozzle manufacturers to uh, to develop those those technologies. Okay, why 
why slow though? Like, what what what's the holdup? If it, if it's such a promising technology, what why why are we so slow on it? Good question. I mean, I think in the last 10, 20 years, every nozzle manufacturer is focused entirely on air induction tips. And they've got a great selection of air induction tips. And air induction doesn't work with PWM for the most part. Some exceptions exist. But for the most part, we can't use those tips in PWM. So we have to now go back to what we would call traditional technology, mm. non-air induced. And so most manufacturers have said, well, use these old nozzles. We, they work, but they're not low drift. You know, yeah. so these are the issues. Now we have to make low drift, the kind of spray quality we've come to expect. We have to re-engineer those for PWM. Let's do it. You know, the market is huge. I was talking to a John Deere fellow. Uh, you know, they have Exact Apply for for John Deere. Cases had AIM Command for twenty years. Now Exact Apply has been entering its third year in the market. But they've done such a good job selling Exact Apply at John Deere that 80% of their Western Canadian new deliveries are Exact Apply equipped. Hmm. So we're seeing probably somewhere around a third of our installed base in sure. Western Canada is PWM. That's a big market. Yep. Hmm. Why not? Why not make nozzles for it? Okay, final question. Uh, any last tips for growers as they head into the burn-off season? Well, I, I think the the eye is always on ag. You know, there's always critics out there. I would say uh, uh, pretend you're being watched. Uh, be blameless in your activities and your decisions. Um, uh, you know, don't don't dump if you don't have to. Don't drift if you don't, if you don't <laughs> have an alternative. And do what you can uh, to prevent those kinds of things from happening. I think we want to be able to tell uh, a great story. Let's do it. Absolutely. Good stuff. Uh, he is Tom Wolf. Follow him, give him a follow on Twitter, at Nozzle Guy. Check him out. Uh, always some great insight. And, of course, Sprayers 101 does uh, great work in uh, making sure, educating you on what you need to do about sprayers and sprayer equipment and application. And, of course, uh, Tom, our series on realagriculture.com spray guys. You betcha. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Real Ag Live. We'll be back in a couple days. On Actually, we'll be back on Thursday. <laughs> Talk to you later.